Hey there students! For our next video we're going to learn how to deal with the stone wall attack by wide. And really this is just my thing that is not that serious and does require a deep analysis, but still it's a good idea to make sure that we uh that we cover it all the same. Uh so okay, uh yeah that looks better. So let's uh get into the different I guess move orders that white can try based around the move E3. I mean up to knight f6. In a lot of cases, this is going to transpose to some other openings where... And if I play Knight F3, obviously that transposes back to my Collet coverage. And if they play C4 instead... Well, I mean, if C4, the lazy option is to play D, C4 and... Well, in that case, you would simply transpose very directly to a Queen's Gambit. Uh, if you do want to try and punish White their move order, then I would suggest playing E6. Knight F3 and A6 and sort of... Wait for him to play some less useful move and then go for your, you know, a6 and b5, c5 stuff. It is true they can play b3 to stop that, but... Well, then c5 is meant to be okay for black, for example. Anyway, it's something that I'll cover more deeply in a later stage, but for now it's not really our priority. Uh, so... Yeah, basically if white plays f4... I mean, bishop f3, d3 is kind of the, the critical move. And the reason bishop d3 is a better move order for playing the stonewall attack is because that way you avoid bishop f5, which just gives black a very powerful bishop here. After knight f3, this is quite an indispensable move. And white's main move here is to play bishop d3, and... I mean, basically at this point, black has so many good moves, so like, it doesn't even like, matter too much which one you choose. Uh, to me, it's a little bit surprising that Hayek's book gives bishop d3 as best, because I think after cd3 that you don't really want to let white have this control over the, uh, the e4 square in this way. I think a much more practical approach is simply to go bishop to e7 and just develop and keep the tension between the bishops. Because if white does play bishop f5, you're very happy to see this. As now you have a very strong grip over e4. If they would have put a knight into e5, we would eventually be able to kick it away with a pawn. And therefore this position is simply very pleasant for black. Uh, for that reason, white may try a different move. You may play knight e5 immediately. But then the break with c5 is a typical way to put some pressure. And after c3, I think simply knight c6 is good. Where white has tried different moves without really impressing. You know, if they play a move like queen e2 or queen c2, that's all allows you to take on d3 in a better version. As why we need an extra move to take with the queen. And if they go h3, trying to, you know, go for g4 or something. I know it's an attack that some club players are a little bit nervous about facing, but objectively it's completely harmless. I mean, after queen b6, say, if white does play to move g4, well, I mean, you can simply take, and, you know, if white plays knight d3, you go knight e4, and, you know, you completely dominate the center, uh, the central light squares, and from there, your plan can be b5, b4 to open up the queen side, while queen d3 can be met with even, let's say, knight e5, and, you know, you can follow up with, like, fe5 and knight e4, or, or even knight d7, I mean, pretty much everything is winning at, uh, at this point for black. Because white has no proper queenside development. Uh, of course, there are other moves they can try, but you know, in principle, this is just going to be very fine for black. Uh, I mean, if they put the bishop on e2, let's say, and try this way, well, then I think we should just play actively with c5. Of course, these moves can kind of be interchanged, so the move order is not that sensitive here. And after, say, c3, you know, you can play bishop d6 even, just keep him guessing as to where exactly we're going to put our. Uh, I'll put our knight on c6 or d7. Uh, I mean, white's best move might be to play knight h4, but it hasn't been tested yet. And I think after rook e8 that... Well, when white takes, we're just going to have beautiful pressure against the e-pawn. Like, this is our dream structure. Because actually the double pawns are a strength, allowing us to go after the e weak squares on the e-file much better. Now, for that reason, white usually plays knight e5 and plays a similar way to before. But again, I mean, h6 is a good prophylaxis. You know, it takes the sting out of g4. Because I can still go to uh, e4 from there. And if knight d2, simply knight c6. And I mean, this position has arisen in many different uh, games, but black scores very well. As white really struggles to find a good post for his bishop. And if he plays b3, we can even play moves like queen b6. And you know, right now we can even just take and you know put a knight on e4 and have very good play down the c file. Since white's piece are a little bit passive and he has not yet solved the problem with this very active uh, Karakhan or London-style bishop on f5. Uh, well, if they try queen e1 instead and play for a direct kingside attack, I just feel like it falls very flat. 
Well, I know in a lot of positions a computer recommends queen b6 as a way to make it very hard for white to develop the uh, the queen side pieces. I mean, again, if g4, just bishop h7, you know, if g5, you can simply take, and I mean, you know, white's attack is nowhere near close to amounting to anything. And black can just meet with a central counter to basically win, you know, very, uh, very convincingly. For a position like this one, I mean, it's just asking for e5 in the near future to rip open the center and say white's king is much more exposed than black's. So we can see that the immediate stonewall is pretty, uh, pretty ineffective. And I mean, if I play c3, you can again just play bishop f5. I mean, either white will play f4 and transpose, or, you know, if they play knight f3, it's going to be like an improved sort of collet system where, you know, after bishop d3... I mean, again, you can even play moves like bishop d6 and really just treat it like a Slav or London with, uh, with colors reversed, depending on how they play it. Uh, I mean, if takes, takes, queen d3. It is worth pointing out in this case, you should probably play queen d7. Not just to defend the pawn, but just so you don't have a trick of queen b5 to win a pawn. That is one tactic we should be aware of. But okay, the most flexible move for white is certainly, well, other than knight f3, to play our bishop to d3 here. Then we can go c5, knowing that, well, knight f3 will transpose to our collet lines. And if dc5, you can even play e5 and you know, just get your pawn back. In a way, that should be very standard knowledge for anyone that has any uh, experience with the queen's gambit accepted. Or with the queen's gambit in general. Uh, you know, after c3, the idea is you take, and in the worst case, you get your pawn back with b6, and you know, life is good after that. Uh, so, anyway, up to c3, knight f6, knight c6. I suppose if white wants, he could actually play an alternative to f4, which is a pure stonewall attack and the most common move by far. Because if they play knight f3, they have slightly move order, sink out of our, our repertoire. Or actually, I don't think they have, I think it is just a transition to a video. It's a bit of time to record the Collet video, so that's why my memory is not 100% certain, but like 99% and certain that we looked at this before. If not, you can let me know in the comments, I can include an update video in the worst case. Uh, Canadian Black's play is pretty obvious, and you just have an improved version of the of the Bishop G5 semi-slav in this case, uh, at least with colors reversed. Uh, now, if they do play Knight D2, the problem is that if White doesn't cover the E5 square, we just go E5. And again, I mean, this position is effectively going to be like a uh, like a uh, Rubenstein French with colors reversed. As White is losing the tempo, and you know, Bishop B5, we can just meet with uh, you know, we're simply Bishop D7, and you know, we're quite happy to trade pieces to accelerate our development and get rid of their good bishop. Well, after Bishop C2 and Bishop D6, again, it's obvious that even if Black just plays very natural moves in this point, the Black's position is obviously preferable with the space advantage and lead in development. So really f4 is kind of the move that, well, is consistent, but unfortunately it's also a mistake for white. So after bishop g4, we can now still get our bishop outside the pawn chain, and, and you know, I mean, if they play h3, we'll put the bishop back on f5 and have a very similar position to what we saw, where the extra tempo of h3 actually doesn't help white all that much here. Uh, I mean, white can go castles or he can play knight bd2, but in like 99% of cases it will transpose. And here I think it actually might be better to put the bishop on d6 rather than e7. It just seems like a slightly more active square and you know, there'll be some position where you might want to put the knight on e7 to support a, you know, coming to f5. Uh, so anyway, white's main move is queen to e1 from this position, but, well, technically knight bd2 is more common from this point, so I will make it the main line and, as before, point out that if h3 that we will go bishop f5. I mean, normally white takes, because, you know, allowing the... Bishop to trade is just, you know, allowing black to get e4 and much more easily advance on the queen side as his middle game plan. Uh, but if white does take, I mean, this structure is very nice and you know, it can meet queen d3 with either knight e4 or even the move of g6. Because the key point is that this structure, like, if they go dc5, I mean, the e3 pawn is a lot weaker than the d5 pawn here. And if you just build up very naturally down this file, it's clear that white is a lot worse. Now, the move queen e1 is... Well, I'll start with knight bd2, actually, because after castles, I think it could easily transpose after queen e1 anyhow. Uh, so, in any case, after queen e1, I think that the most natural is actually to play the move bishop f5 voluntarily, which might seem a little bit weird, but on the other hand, I don't think queen e1 is really a very useful move for white, because it actually makes it much harder for him to keep the tension between these bishops now. I mean, if white plays bishop f5, which is kind of the obvious move here, what we take, and I mean, once again, this structure is well known to be just very nice for black. 
Uh, to be fair, White's score is not as bad as I thought it would be. Like, White sort of holds very close to 50% in practice. I think that a very simple move is just to play Rook to E8 here. You know, let them play Queen H4 if they want, and, you know, we just go Queen B6. And again, make it very hard for White to sensibly develop. And if he moves his Knight, we can get the E4 square and can also kick away their Knight with F6 later. So I think that Black is simply much better in this position, uh, as simple as that. Uh, so yeah, it's true that, you know, if we want to be more thorough, we would cover the lines a lot more deeply, but I just don't really think it's necessary. I mean, if Queen E1 and castles, I think that White doesn't really have a better move than Knight D2. Uh, I mean, if knight e5, you just play bishop f5 again, and... I mean, if white plays bishop e2, you just play rook c8, and you know, just go for the... The standard play, like knight e7, and, you know, just uh, push your queenside pawns is a good plan in general. Let's go h6, bishop h7 to anticipate g4. You know, like knight d2, and, uh... Well, maybe you go queen c7 first, and then play these, uh, these plans I mentioned. Uh, well... Because uh, if I play knight seven, we want to be able to kick their knight away without them being able to trade the knight, is the idea of this move. Uh, now, if they play queen e2 instead, then yeah, you can just play queen b6. By keeping the tension between the bishops, we make their life a bit more difficult. Now, after king h1, I think that simply takes. And then a nice move of knight e7 will completely neutralize any attempts to attack. You know, we stop them playing f5. You know, maybe we can even go queen a6 later and head for a good endgame while pushing our queen side pawns and. Going for a place similar to the minority attack in the Carlsbad formation. So anyway, I think that this is really a sufficient answer. And I mean, it's true that like if this was aimed at maybe super GMs, perhaps I would go a little bit deeper. But I think that this is really sufficient for getting a very good position and getting uh, fine for an advantage of black in these lines. <clears throat> I mean, E3 is just quite a passive move, especially when we go for these kind of Bishop F5 or Bishop G4 style setups. So anyway, good luck with playing this in your uh, in your own games and. In the next video, I'm going to be covering the move of bishop to g5, which is a move that doesn't have as good a reputation as a Tromposki, but I actually found it to be a very tricky try. And I think the black should be quite well prepared to come out of this with a fine position. So I'll see you in the next video for the coverage of bishop g5.